I'm using so much stuff from this book at the moment. Um, uh, I'm doing a project at the moment that's like making a kind of HTML widget to be and then embedded in a shiny app and stuff and I'm using stuff from it like on a day-to-day -day basis at the moment and I'd really never done this kind of stuff like um, before a couple of months ago I, I mean before starting the book club um, yeah so it's <laughs> it's working out pretty well to be honest um, yeah, uh, so today, um, I don't know whether Ryan will be joining us. He's not said that he won't be, and he's usually um, here for these things. Um, yeah, Arthur and Lucio, are you are you both part of the Mastering Shiny book club as well at the moment? Mm, yes, this is my case. Okay, okay. No, no, but I wish I were. <laughs> oh, right, okay. I thought I'd seen your name in the Mastering Shiny chat. Um, right, okay. Um, I think I joined to kind of uh, see what's see what's going on. I'm I'm kind of looking maybe for like the engineering project, product, mm. production grade uh, apps uh, cohort uh, in future. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was quite a useful book to be honest. I I thought I mean um, I I was surprised by like how little kind of of a golem bias there was in it, and the there was like. Um, it, it was like a, a kind of methodology for uh, developing apps and Gollum provided additional tools that, that would make that easier. But the, 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 the central kind of um, thesis of the book was, you know, a, about bringing kind of good software engineering practices to our developers who were doing shiny work it was a it was a, a really valuable book to learn especially like you know kind of professionally but um i kind of expected it to be like a golem tutorial and it didn't end up being at all um but yes i'd, I'd strongly recommend it if 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 there are other people in the alpha data science community who want to do it um yeah um okay cool so today um we um we are working through the uh, kind of shiny focused section of a book called uh, JavaScript for R by John Cohen. And um, uh, the chapter we are going to be looking at is called Tips and Tricks. It's chapter 13 at the moment in, in the first edition. Um, and um, this is um, a few kind of, th 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 um, the cent central thing about this part of the book seems to be, you know, how um, although you can develop shiny applications without really writing a, a note of JavaScript, um, there are a lot of places within um, the, the typical shiny development um setting where a little bit of javascript can really help you out and and this chapter i thought was quite useful um in terms of um kind of framing that idea i thought um so some of the stuff that were in the previous couple of chapters were about you know how does shiny send data to javascript and how does javascript send data to shiny and, and things here you're seeing a couple of practical places where you might use that in a in, on a typical kind of working week um and lucio is going to be taking us through this chapter um so um do you have a, a screen share or uh, that you could set up lucio um, Can you see my screen? I can't see your screen yet. No. Oh, yes, we can see it now. So, do you want, okay. do you want to tell us a little bit about you, Lucio? So, you, my understanding uh, is you're a, a kind of you're a graduate student or an undergraduate student? Uh, and... Undergraduate student. Uh, I study pure mathematics in in Latin America. Mm. Uh, but my main interests interests are 
uh, maybe programming and how to, and a little bit of web development. I'm trying to learn uh, a couple of, sorry, a, a little bit of JavaScript as well. Hmm. Cool, cool. Right, well, um, yeah, I mean, by all means, uh, kind of take over whenever you feel comfortable. Um, okay, great. Okay. okay, so this chapter is called Tips and Tricks. And it, it isn't really about implementing more tools to Shiny, like we have, we have been doing in earlier sessions, for example, with HTML widgets, but it's more like a, a, deeper, a deeper exploration in tools that Shiny always has by default. Uh, for example, no, like events that Shiny re recognizes and this, and this JavaScript library called jQuery that it facilitates uh, the DOM manipulation. So how we access to elements in the, in the browser. Um, so basic, basically that is really a very short chapter. So I added a little new section uh, because it's so short. So I hope that we can actually get to that because it's a little bit interesting. Okay, so the first section in this chapter is Shiny Events. Uh, the author proposes a, a very specific application that uh, a GIF will be displayed whenever the Shiny server is busy. And with this idea of the Shiny server is busy, there is an implementation of a shiny event. So something that JavaScript can recognize. So implementation first starts uh, via, the, via downloading, downloading this GIF. Uh, I, I send you, by the way, I send you the, maybe I will, I will send it again because I think that Ryan joined us recently, but I send the RMD file for this chapter if you would like to follow along. So once we, we apply this code, it's basically just uh, down, downloading this over here. I, I don't know if it is visible. I think not. Ah, oh, no, it is. Oh, no. Okay, it is. Basically downloading this here. This will be what we will display whenever there is some code that Shiny is running. Well, in the server is running. So the way they do it is first they set up a, a how do you say, a Shiny app. Well, this is a code. I will just copy paste example and maybe explain a little bit what it is doing. We have, we have our folder for this app. It's called app 00. Here are the folder of the dependencies. We, we we will write some JavaScript, some CSS, and this is a GIF. And so the, the author defines uh, the application in this way. Well, it's actually the same code, so I will just explain. So we start with the application, we load the, this folder of resources. Also, the styling, the, the styling that we will, will be using, some JavaScript the GIF that we just downloaded and some, some plot that will be rendered in after two seconds whenever the, the user clicks on this button. So say if I were to run this app, it would work like this. Okay, it was kind of lagging my computer. Oh, it's still like, okay. Here is the URL. Let me open it in the browser. Oh, I didn't open. Oh, it's not opening. Ah, I was opening too many of them. But it was lagging again. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so this is the app, right? That the user proposes show a GIF whenever the Chinese server is busy. Uh, as we can see, whenever we click on the button, it 
the, this is this this graphic changes it becomes a little bit transparent because uh, Ch the Chinese server is busy and in that moment this gives is shown so how does uh, how does the author do that basically in this section he defines right this is the HTML element where we load this this gif I don't know if it is a GIF. I will just call it GIF. It, it gives it an, it gives it it gives it an idea of loading so that then we can style it in our file styles.css. It's basically just changing uh, where the screen is located and making sure that it is always this this GIF is always placed on top of everything else in the page, as you can see in this line. And also Okay, so here's the important part, right? Uh, how, how do we uh, execute some code whenever Shine is busy or maybe other, maybe other condition? So this is a, the interesting part. It is using the, the jQuery library over here. So we call it, right? Uh, to a document, we add an event, an event listener. The, the name of the event is Shiny busy. Um, the instructions uh, given that event, this, this one over here, is that when the, the, the server is busy, we want to, well, to this GIF that we have loaded, uh, make it visible. So we apply this styling to it. And whenever the server is idle, so it's, it's become like inactive or it has finished some computation, we, we have a similar syntax, right? So we access the document, we add an event listener. And now for this event called shiny uh, double dot, I, I don't know how it is set idle. The instruction for that event is that again, we, we access this GIF and we want it to hide it because the server is no longer active. So really that's the main idea in the whole chapter. Uh, adding event listeners to a document, uh, exploring what you can do with, with a, a variety of events that Shiny already has provided you by default. There is also Shiny message, Shiny, shiny value, and those will be explored in the, in the extra chapter that I added because the author didn't cover it, but I think that they were really interesting. Okay, so after this section comes a, another app. In this case, the author proposes that we start with a data table. He's actually going to work with the data set empty cars. So we assume that we are all familiar with it. So we start with the data, data table of this data set. And what he wants to do is to, to touch data frame at a column where in each row of such column, we have a button and that button, whenever we click on it, uh, there will be some message displayed in the bottom section of the app. So as you can see, wait, no, maybe just, let's take it in order. I kind of I kind of rushed the last application. So we can, we can build it from scratch perhaps. Let's see, I will do it. I think it's over here. Or maybe another one. The new one. Okay, so this is the code. We have loaded the library for for data frames, shiny. Uh, in in the application, we have an output for the table, the data frame that we're going to show. And in this table, we are we are passing a couple parameters, but the author mentions that they, they really aren't important, except for this one. We set escape to false so that when we add content to the table in the form of a string, such content can be recognized as HTML in a way that whenever the, the, the table is played in the page, such HTML code will actually be rendered as an HTML object. 
So if we put the code for a button, well, the HTML code for a button in this table, uh, thanks to these parameters, escape being set to false is that we can actually display a button in the page. So say I were to, to run this app. It's still lagging in the computer, okay. Uh, until now, it's just a, a data frame being shown. So really, still nothing. Now, now what I just already explained was the escape uh, false parameter does. So the author wants to add exactly this line of code uh, to a new column of this, of this data frame. Uh, and the way he does it is via some, some automatic process where all of these string remain the same. So what he's doing is he's finding, it, it's not really a button, it's an anchor element, but let, let's call it a button because the author does. Uh, it, it's defining a pseudo button so that when you click on it, uh, we are going to set and to we are going to set a value to an input uh, whose ID is click, and the value that we are going to set to such input is uh, this is uh, the name of the row of the of the data set empty cars. So if we were to play, for example, in a row names right to the empty cars data set, we would get all of this. We have to make this as a string, changing only this value uh, via all of them, these uh, substitute values. Okay, and, and the way the, the author proposes to do that, doesn't, at least it, it didn't work for me. He does it with, uh, there is a question. Or? <laughs> Sorry, no. Uh, it's quite often the case with uh, when you're working, when you're following stuff in the books, it doesn't quite work for you. So you you use the s printf method, and it didn't quite work. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, he uses s printf twice. The first time it works when we define this section over here. But the second part, when he does it to, to complete, right, the rest of this string that he wants, it, it doesn't really work. There is a, a, it's really a really dumb mistake in the in the HTML code. It's like everything works except for a extra space that it is added. And that is enough for, for the whole thing to fall apart. So it, it doesn't really work. It's just one space that makes it all fail. Uh, so, if we instead use uh, not this not this version that the book proposes, but maybe a little more naive one, the yeah, page zero, because we are simply pasting strings like we do over here, uh, it does work. So um, yeah, I will just show that the final product. It's over here. It's basically doing this. Uh, the same, right? We have uh, these libraries. He adds some space, and we are going to show we are going to show our data table. And um, this at the bottom of the page, there is going to be a, a a certain region where some text will be displayed, as we can see in this output with ID model. Okay, so what he is doing is that uh, over here. In this, this line of code, or maybe I will just run it, because I can do it. Okay. So what is doing that? It is simply, generating this, uh, this part of the string that we want. The only thing that it is changing is the and then this part over here is, I think it's the, the name of the row. So we already have this uh, 
and this subsection of the string that we want for the button to be generated as HTML. And now to complete right the, the whole scene, it's simply to apply this. And once I render it, no, once I execute it, it's lying so much. Okay. I see the result. So you, you're I, making a vector of HTML code. Yes, exactly. And each one defines a button that will eventually be added to, to, to this table. Yeah, as we uh, can see over here, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same as the first case that we had. The only thing that is changing is the, uh, the name of the row for the data frame. Okay, so once that is being done, we have the HTML code to be inserted into the data frame. So we simply insert it, right? So this is the vector of the HTML code. So to this data set, we add that column. And now we simply render that column into the, sorry, that data frame into the page with, with this parameter being the important one. Now, now the final part is that whenever the user clicks in, Oh, no, it is click. No, that's weird. There's no click. I oh, know because we are defining it over here. Lucio. Yes. I have a quick comment and Russ and Arthur, uh, this particular comment about uh, only setting it once uh, or getting an error. I think that has to do with the, the registry of that function. Um, when shiny renders uh, the, the shiny input value, uh, I think it's similar to a registration. So the object only renders once by running your second code, uh, we're pasting in that line of text as a exchange between server and document object, allowing it to uh, refresh itself. Um, Russ, the, the page that I'm referring to or the section that I'm referring to is on uh, chapter 12, there was a, there's a paragraph in there where it talks about running it once. Now, the example is register input handler. In Lucio's example, it was set input handler. So there is a slight difference between the two, but I have a reason to believe that the activity of what we're doing with the uh, shiny language is having a similar output. I don't know that for a fact. I'm, okay, I'm it, it opening up for, yeah. It seems quite surprising to me. I, I, I certainly think um, that you can have multiple um, multiple elements in an app that are all capable of setting some um, the value of some object on in the shiny server side. Um, you, you can have multiple things in your app that's capable of, you know, modifying the value of a um, of, of a given input. And maybe that's where my confusion um, is coming in. The term that I'm referring to is a input handler, whereas yeah, yeah. what Lucio is showing us on his presentation is set input value. Yeah. Yes. And this. And despite the repetition, right, of this uh, function, we are only using one input ID, and it is click. Okay, so how does the final lab look? It's okay. It's like this. Uh, we have a the frame. We added this column over here button. And say I were to click in this first row. In the bottom section, I get this text. That is exactly the name of, of such row, right? Because we gave, it, we gave it that parameter over here. If I click in the second row, we, wait, what? It's the same, okay. 
Ah, no, it was different. I thought it was the same result. Yeah, and such. It's really quite simple. Huh? Okay, and lastly, uh, well, lastly, in what the book and what the book covers in these three sections is about jQuery. As I mentioned in the, oh no, first of all, so we're going to use jQuery, the JavaScript library, in order to toggle the display of some elements in the page. But we are going to execute such code, uh, not directly via JavaScript, but via the message handler that we have been doing with this. No, sorry, with, with this. I oh, know, so it was directly via JavaScript, I'm sorry. Okay, so in the book, they mentioned that this library is already loaded by default into Shiny, so we don't have to load it. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's really useful in order to manipulate the elements of the page. And also, it, it gives us a more compact, like less character, less characters a syntax for when we want to write code in order to define some events and some instructions whenever some event happens. Uh, he also mentions uh, it's used for CSS, CSS animations, but uh, well, there were no examples of that and I didn't add into it. So for example, if we were to go into this website, that, that we will visit in the, in the last section of this talk, and we will explore a little bit, right? Uh, what is what this library allows us to do, and this function that it, it will be the one that we will be using in order to toggle the display. We can do, for example, the following. Let, let me just copy that. Okay, so we open the, the browser console. Okay, and we have the following. Only this. We're, we're using jQuery and we can know that via yeah, this dollar sign in the beginning. And um, what goes over here in this parenthesis is the, the CSS selector. So in this page, there is some L HTML element whose ID is RStudio header. So because it, it is an ID, it's CSS selector uh, would that would need, sorry, um, a hashtag in the in the first section over here so that it is recognized. For example, if I were to, no, okay, if I were to execute this code, it is it is hiding and showing this part over here of the, of the page because that is it, it's ID. Also, simil also similarly, we can select not via ID, but via some arbitrary CSS selector. So per perhaps via the class. As we can see here, its class name is highlight, and it's a class because it's, it's using the point. And now it's hiding this code. And of course, we can also do the same okay, for paragraphs. Now it would be an HTML element. So uh, the application that the author proposes, uh, let me, yeah, let me copy it and explore it a little bit. It's over here. Let's see, we load Shiny and the user interface for this application. Okay. We're going to execute some extract, some function whenever this message is sent from, from R or from the server. And what we will be doing is that we're going to be given a selector and then we are going to toggle the display of that selector. Like I just did, for example, with here was P or, or some ID. Okay, so that is that. Then we're going to define a button that activates this toggling 
we're going to show some header whose ID and class we define, and some deep, so some HTML container whose class is named also to tutorial. So it's the same class for these two elements. But what we're going to include in, in this container is some text uh, which will be the value of this button. So whenever we click right in this button, initially it's value zero and we are going to see in this output how it is increasing, it is, it is increasing one by one as we click on this button. Now, lastly, we can see for this button whose ID is tagging, we are, going, we are setting that whenever this button is clicked, we are sending some instructions, uh, sorry, some custom message, is ID or its identifier is jQuery, so the same as we have over here. And we're, the, the, the data that we're sending in this case is a selector, so we are using this class, which is the same as the class over here, right? So the idea is that whenever we click on this button, uh, the elements whose class is this, so this header and this div, it's it's uh, it's display should be doubled. As we are doing over here. Uh, this will, I will explain this. Okay, so let's simply run the app. Okay. We have our button. I click on it, and the whole thing gets hidden because the whole scene has class to tabel. And we are giving JavaScript instructions to toggle such elements. So now I click on it again, and it is being shown. As you can see here, uh, the value of this action button is changing, and it is going up one by one whenever I click on it. So I click once, I click again, and now it's four, because I click twice. So. This, this um, when I read this section of the book, it came as a bit of a surprise, to be honest, that uh, with with jQuery, you could do one selection and then call dot toggle on whatever's returned by that. And it would toggle every element within that, that had been um, selected. Um, it, simply because I don't use jQuery that much, but uh, be, because um, were I to do that in like vanilla JavaScript, I would do some query that returns an array of elements and then iterate over each element, toggling each one in turn. So I was quite surprised to see that the method toggle could be applied immediately to every element of the that that, that matches the um, jQuery query. Um, so yeah, that was quite, that was quite useful to know. Um, yeah. And so, I say sorry. Sorry. Um, but um, the 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 application for this kind of thing is to kind of um, uh, make different parts of your user interface um, kind of to to hide and reveal them and to um, kind of, um, um, you know, change the formatting or the position or something like that. Um, so, it, I mean, the example is good in that it's, it's simple enough to understand, but, but the, the aim is to kind of make it simpler to do things like the, um, what is it now, the shiny kind of update UI type. Um, um, workflow, which is a, a, quite difficult to code up and quite difficult to, to, to reason about, really. Um, but yeah, that's quite neat. So have you have you used jQuery much before, Lucio? Uh, I tend to avoid it. I, I prefer to stick to vanilla JavaScript. Uh, but yeah, I a little bit, a little bit jQuery. So, um, okay, so, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. So an, an example though uh, on the uh, the R Studio page, 
of um, you know how to kind of make different parts of the website disappear and whatnot. That was really that was really neat. And yes, so also I forgot to mention that uh, this last application, right, that it is defined in the book, it isn't really the same as I have presented here. Uh, I think you mentioned the last that for the for the application showing the book, he uses over here only the class. He's he's giving directly the class, and he adds a point and then the name of the class. But I I I changed it to only give the selector because in this later section, uh, for example, we we can do something like we have already something like this. We have already defined what we want to happen whenever this message is being sent. Uh, however, we can actually change what will happen whenever this message is being sent. So like a, redef a redefinition of these instructions. Uh, also, no, also entirely via JavaScript, but it is also using the tools in this, in this section, sorry, the tools in this chapter. And those are this idea of shiny events and the capabilities of the jQuery library. So in order, because, because there is time, I would like to show a, a couple more examples of shiny events that the, well, I think the book, the book never mentions them, but in the link that they provide, right? In this section, shiny events, which is this page, uh, I found them really interesting actually. Here is a, here is a, I think, I don't know if it's a complete list of all shiny events, but at least the one I, I am interested in maybe sharing, or perhaps you already know them, I don't know. I didn't know them, so I wanted to share. It's this shiny message, um, shiny input changed, and uh, shiny value. Yeah. I have used the, the shiny idle thing and shiny busy before quite a lot to be honest but um it's, it's very rare that i need to uh work with the these uh, these events um but um yeah it's a really interesting page this because I, I don't think it's um as as widely known as it ought to be really the 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 different kind of codes that you can get back from the the shiny server um, so you so you wanted to show something with the message uh, yes it's the latest mm. section okay so well as i have already explained the goal is simply to explore these three types of shiny events shiny message a shiny value and well lastly a shiny input change because they allow us a kind of redefinitions of instructions that we have already provided in the R code, but we can change such instructions uh, purely via JavaScript. Okay, so this first event, it's called shiny message. It will be triggered when some message is being sent from the server. So I will stick to this application that we have already, that I have already shown. I will simply be running code or well, JavaScript into it. So for example, say uh, we define this, right? To this document, uh, we want that whenever this event occurs, shiny message, we want to print into the console such event. Only to get a, a, like a basic idea, right? Of what's going on and, <clears throat> and when this event is being triggered. So I copy such code into the page. Okay. And now I do some, in, some arbitrary interaction, right? So I will click on the, on the button. And we have already one, two, three, four, five, six, seven events. And say I will open the first one. We can see is this message, what sorry, this event, this event has a property message whose value is busy. So it, it's a usual kind that we are accustomed with shiny. The second message that was being sent is, uh, 
Well, I didn't know this one. Binding message, progress. Okay, I didn't really know that one. That's our one. There was one specific specific that I wanted to show you. Okay, this is this is it. This search message has always been sent. And we can see its property message. It, it is telling us, right, that actually the the message that, we, that was being sent is the one that we defined for this application, this, this part over here. And also this value that we provided from R to JavaScript, this dot to toggle, is actually what we can access from here. So I will only, only to finish which other message were being sent. Over here we go to its message something recalculating. Ah, yeah, because there were some dependencies and chains, so it needed to update some output. And here is the one that you mentioned, the BCE. It has finished the calculations. And I think that's the last one. Uh, well, something about, ah. That a message for printing the value that we are seeing over here in this gray section. Okay. The really the only, the only important one that I wanted to show was the third one, the custom that we make, because now we can access its properties. So the only thing that we need to do is like how to access that values. We have for here, right? The event. Then we go to message. Then we go to custom. Then to jQuery, and. The value in such, let's say, location is this over here. So we have already a way to access that value. And what in the in the book they mentioned that we can actually change the value that, that is being sent. So like if we were to to redefine this part over here, giving this message that it is being sent. So I will copy this code. And now we're doing right like. Now, whenever this event, shiny message is being triggered, we want to, for this event, we'll first check if we have, if there is, well, if this section, this event dot message that, that custom that dot jQuery is well defined. So like we, if we can access that value. And now that if we can do it, now we're going to set that value to this CSS selector. So it's like if we are changing this data that is being sent to JavaScript, okay? So re remember first, when we clicked in this, the whole page got, got like hidden. And now, because we're going to send it an identifier and only this element, this header has such identifier, uh, only this header should be the, the thing that we will be hidden because it, the toggle only will be applied to, to that element. Okay, so I execute this code, right? I change the value that is being sent from R to JavaScript. And now when I click on it, only the header is being here. And of course I get errors because of this part over here. Not every event, not every event has this, I don't know if it's called methods or properties. Uh, but still it works. So like the summary is that even if we can define them a message for instructions from R to JavaScript, we can then change the, the data that is being sent from R to JavaScript uh, via this uh, JavaScript code. Okay. So was that clear? Mm. That's really neat. The the I mean the events. It looks like a really neat way that I hadn't really considered before for like debugging problems that that might arise with, um, with shiny. You know, if if um you uh think you've set a value on the server that you uh, haven't that you know and and things like that, it, it may be possible to kind of debug that kind of situation using this document on shiny um what would it be 
shiny binding, I guess. So stuff like that. But yeah, yeah, no, that was really cool. Thanks for adding extra stuff to the uh to the the chapters code. It was quite neat to see you like kind of hacking an app. Um uh Arthur and Ryan, do you have any questions or comments or anything? I don't have any direct comments other than I should probably up my jQuery game and or uh, start to exercise some of the activities of JavaScript, uh, maybe outside of Shiny necessarily, but then uh, following the, the document, being able to uh, execute some of the Shiny language components interacting with the JavaScript library. Kind of picking up on some stuff we were discussing, I think it was last last week. I wonder if uh, Lucio has just kind of pointed out a way maybe we could do some some testing. I mean, if if tools don't already tackle this, I mean, I, in a certain sense, I guess we can kind of recover. Um, maybe we could somehow log shiny events um, in maybe passing them to JavaScript and then. JavaScript writing, maybe writing that event stream to file. I, I don't know, just kind of thinking out loud. Kind of the log data concept, right, Arthur? Yeah, something like that. Really cool presentation. Hmm. There's, a, um, there's, a, there's a package called, um, what is it now? It's, it's for kind of um, watching changes in the reactive graph of a, a shiny app um react log yes yeah I, I suspect it's probably using these um um events in the background to 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 kind of populate the you know what causes what to change and things like that um yeah it's, no it's really cool i'll have to learn i think more. it's actually using this event here because mm. Writing this quote, uh, like it is mentioned, what happens right when some output needs to update because uh, one of its dependencies changed. So, like 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 they mentioned here, right? We have we have an output X, which takes a reactive dependency on Y, and I I am not going to read the whole thing, but they mentioned right which kind of events, which shiny events are being triggered whenever. Is there is some calculation there is we send some message when the calculation is finished and then some message for the actual value uh, like the final product of such calculation right and that's the idea of this event shiny value and um, it gets triggered when an output receives a value from the server and the basic idea is we have one output in this application, it is this text, well, this section over here that we are displaying right now, the value of the action button, but we can also change that. So on, first only to get an understanding, right, of what is this event. To read into its value, we are going to console log it. So I will update this with this little app. Right, now we do that, right? Uh, this event gets triggered and we console log it. I click on toggle text and this is the event that was, that occurred, shiny value. And over here, the important part, at least for this, over here. In this event, it's property value. It's exactly the, the, the code that we, well, maybe the string, the code that we will be inserted into this gray area. Maybe it's not, no, it is. No, I wanted to see if it can if it look exactly the same so that it could be obvious. Okay, now, now yes. Hmm. Value six, then shiny action button value. And as we can see, it's the same thing over here. And, and similarly, uh, as a previous as a previous example, we can again write. We have that for this event shiny value. If we access value, we have uh, 
such information that is going to be displayed into the page. And now we can change that information. Uh, it's, sim it's similar to the previous case. So it's only defining this code. We're doing right. Uh, when the document uh, gets triggered some event chain value to this event, we can access that value that is being sent from R to JavaScript and that will and that will be rendered into the page. And here I'm changing the output of that value. It will no longer be the, the value of this action button. It will simply be this line of text. So I I execute this code and when I click on toggle text, well again, because it, it is not hidden. Now the value changed to what I defined. <laughs> um, okay, so, so far I didn't really think like a, some example of how it could be useful, but I don't know, I really find it really interesting. Like it opens possibilities, I think. I, I really haven't like I don't have an example for even one possibility, but I don't know it's probably useful. And now this last this last one is uh, that we can change also the input. Sorry, the value of some input. This is the idea of the shiny input change event. It will be triggered when an input possibly has a new value. They, they say possibly because, for example, in, in this action button, right? If I were to click on it not via, say via my mouse, but directly via JavaScript, uh, its, its value will also change. And uh, uh, it would take a while to do it. So, so, so please just believe me, it, it can change. Sorry, this event can be triggered if, even if the input doesn't, doesn't really change its value, but there was some Java, JavaScript code that make this event real. For example, like clicking on an anchor or clicking on, on some button. Okay, so similarly, we add such event listener to a document and we console log the event. We get an idea of what's happening. Um, now it some shiny input change event one was registered when I clicked on the button. And here the important part was here. Were well, important for this for this example that for this event we can also we can also access its value and as we saw in the previous two examples we can change that value so over here the value is one now I click again and if I open such event the value is two because it is detecting the change in this action button and I, as it is being printed its value is precisely what we can access now via this event, via the value property. So the last part was simply to show that we can also change the value of inputs whenever they get, uh, sorry, we can change the value of some input via JavaScript uh, whenever they are, they are changed, either via JavaScript also, or via the user interacting, maybe via some click or something. So we do, we have this event listener to the document. And now when this event, if its name is toggle, that, that is if it's information, uh, I, I, should have, I think that's the ID. Yeah, if the, if the ID of the input that triggered this event uh, is toggle, so this button over here that we defined, in that case, I want to change the value of such input, uh, simply add two to it. So I will reload the page again, so that the value starts as zero. And we can see here, I execute this code, I click, and um, it should be one, but I added two. So, no, sorry, sorry. It was zero, but I, I set the value to add two, so it should be two right now. So once I click again, it will be added twice. No, no, it will be added two, so it should be four. That's the case. 
So it ignores completely the, the basic is the, the, the default extraction the Chinese gives so that whenever we, you click in an action button, its value should update by should increase by one, but we can change that behavior. Now, whenever this is clicked, its value increases by two. Okay, and, and that's really it. Wow, brilliant. Yes, no, that was great. Thanks so much, Lucia. That was really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Has anyone got anything they want, want to add, Ryan or Arthur? Um, no. Um, I, I think uh, this is a nice, a nice chapter. Uh, the chapter on kind of like shiny events uh, with the, uh, the 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 Hadley the Hadley GIF uh, 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 kind of. Kind of reminded me. Well, I mean, I guess it's like how the internals might work to some degree of a uh, John's uh, package waiter, uh, which is really quite nice. Uh, these little CSS animations and things like that that can uh, take over part or uh, all of the screen uh, when 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 Shiny is doing something. Although maybe the Hadley GIF is 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 more compelling. Well, uh, thanks, Lucio. Do you, do you think you'll be able to attend any of the further meetings? You you were saying that you you'd like to, but you have kind of conflicts with um, lectures and stuff. Is that right? Uh, yes, I have checked if there are any more like festivities or holidays in where I live. But I think there aren't, so this will probably be my last one. <laughs> That's like a life attendance, yeah. Cool, cool. Well, thank you ever so much for, uh, for for doing today's talk. It was really good. Um, next week, we're doing chapter 14, which I think is on it, input bindings for um, um, how to bind values to the inputs in, in Shiny from JavaScript in a bit more detail than we did in the previous chapter. Um, OK, I hope to see as uh, many of you as can turn up there next week. Uh, I think I'm I, I, I'm down to present that one. I think uh, the we have no other people booked in to do any of the the, the chapters. So if if either of you fancy doing a chapter uh, soon, there's plenty of scope to choose from. Um, but yeah, again, thank you, Lucio, and that was a really great talk. Uh, so I'll see you later, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.